Hello, this is the Professional Educators of Tennessee. We are doing a short, um, a short presentation on an introduction to dyslexia. So all of you who are watching this presentation will know exactly what it's about and have an idea of what we're talking about when we say dyslexia. I'm delighted to have Dr. Michael Hart, PhD, who's a child psychologist with 25 years of experience in parent and teaching training, educational technology, learning differences and diagnostics, assessment of dyslexia and attention problems. He is the founder and owner of www.drmichaelhart.com and is currently providing online webinars and courses regarding the proper educational care of our dyslexic students. Dr. Hart is intensely focused on supporting parents and teachers as they become better informed and more experienced in the effective treatment of our dyslexic students. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you today. As Bethany mentioned, this is going to be relatively short, but I hope meaningful for you. And we're going to be able to talk about a lot of different aspects of dyslexia and finish up with some practical implications. So the roadmap today is very simple. We're going to talk about what dyslexia is, what causes dyslexia, what it looks like in the classroom, as long as as well as again practical implications based on research. So dyslexia is a language-based learning problem which results in difficulties with reading, writing, spelling, and even math because we do know that so much of what we learn in math is actually a function of language. But oftentimes people ask me, well, what does language-based learning problem mean? So this is the way I'd like to conceptualize it for you. The concept is, is that certain people's brains process language in a way that makes it difficult for them to learn the basic building blocks of literacy, the basic building blocks of reading, writing and spelling. So it's really a function of how one's brain is wired and whether they have the issues or the difficulties in certain parts of their brain that impedes their ability to master reading, writing, and spelling. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. But struggles with dyslexia impact the very basic building blocks necessary for building for literacy development, and ultimately, of course, comprehension. So in a minute, I'm going to talk a little bit about how it's a very step-by-step -step process that really should be thought about in terms of basic building blocks. So we, we build on one step of mastery to the next step of mastery, and so on and so forth, until the point at which a person becomes an effective reader. Now, ultimately, that's going to impact comprehension. So that is obviously the, uh, the um, primary goal of reading, correct? So we're going to talk about how that, how kind of all those pieces fit together. And ultimately, dyslexia can make it very hard for students to master basic reading skills within the typical instructional environment. We know very clearly from the research that they need more specific help. Dyslexia is also a lifelong issue. I know that there's oftentimes some myths out there in the community that somehow this is something that goes away after you know second or third grade. But quite frankly, I would suspect that many of you listening know somebody in your family or in your extended social network who has struggled with reading and has kind of represented this concept that this is a lifelong issue that does not go away which means we have to be very thoughtful about how to care for our students all the way through their academic career. And of course, dyslexia is most challenging during your ac academic years for obvious reasons, right? I mean, in the beginning, we are required to learn and develop our literacy skills and then use those skills to show the world that we have, uh, we're learning in the academic environment. So the question I want to ask you to keep in the back of your mind is let's think about how a student's brain is wired and how it matches or fits with the educational environment that they're in or the current teaching style 
that is being used with them in the school setting. So it's not just about how the child's brain is wired, but it's also about being thoughtful about the educational environment and making sure that we're providing the right match or the right fit depending on how that child's brain functions. So the cause of dyslexia, I think the researchers are still fairly cautious, but I know it is uh, very commonly perceived to be an inherited disorder. It does run in families. And I've, after my 20 year, five years of experience, I'm quite convinced of this, that there are uh, pretty clear, clear indicators that we're going to learn about as the years go by to, to fully document that this is an inherited disorder. I want to make it very clear, though, that it is not correlated with intelligence. Dyslexic kids are by and large average to above average in intelligence, so their reading difficulties are not related to intelligence. And in fact, there are many, many, many very intelligent kids who nonetheless, by virtue of their brain's wiring, struggle with the acquisition of effective reading skills. Now, what's been most exciting, I think, over the last couple of decades has been that, well, first of all, historically, when we evaluate a child for or a person for dyslexia, we give them the traditional tests, and then we interpret those test results, and based on that interpretation, we decide whether this uh, child or student has dyslexia or some other type of learning issue. But in the last couple of de decades, we've been able to use this technology called functional MRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging which literally allows us to observe the brain's functioning while a person is engaged in the act of reading. So what that's allowed us to do is take a look at the brain functioning of a struggling reader and compare that to the brain functioning of a person who's not struggling with the reading process. And perhaps even more exciting, it gives us the opportunity to analyze the functioning in the brain prior to intervention, and then again after intervention or reading remediation, and how that particular instructional model that we're testing either is effective or ineffective in terms of allowing for the improvements in the functioning of the brain in those specific areas that we can see from using the functional MRI tool. So that's a very, very important point to make, that we are getting to the point where we're going to be able to literally measure effective interventions and remediations based on the impact that it has on the functioning of the brain. Now, dyslexia, I think probably is common sense, too, that it looks differently at different ages, and that's primarily because there are different environmental demands. Of course, the demands first grade are different than they are in fourth grade and then they are in eighth grade and on through high school and into college. So we really have to think about it not just in terms, again, of their wiring, but also what the environmental demands are. But at the core, the research is very clear that one of the core characteristics of somebody who has dyslexia is the difficulty with mastering what's called the sound symbol relationship. And I'm going to break that down and make it very, very simple. It's the difficulty with mastering the ability to automatically attach a sound to a letter so that when they first begin to start reading, they want to understand what an A sounds like, what a B sounds like, what a C sounds like, and so on. And then from there, the next basic building block is being able to understand what a grouping of letters sound like and being able to, to sound out words. And when they get to that level, then they're able to start developing what we call a uh, sight vocabulary, which means that a child or a person can look at a word on a page, and they know immediately and automatically what that word is. And they don't have to go through the process of sounding out every syllable. Because you can imagine that if you have to go through that sound symbol relationship every single time you're reading, it's going to create a tremendous amount of energy drain for you. So this, over the time, this slow, laborious reading creates an increasing gap 
between those struggling readers and non-struggling readers because if you're expending all your energy on running out words and decoding words is the term for it, then you don't have any energy left to one, build your fluency and the rate at which you read, much less your comprehension. So from the very beginning of this process, there are these basic building blocks that if they aren't mastered, there is a domino effect all the way down the line, all the way to comprehension. So what do you see? What does it look like in a classroom? You're going to see reading avoidance. You're going to see kids are going to do anything they possibly can not to read, especially not to read out loud. You're going to listen and hear that that these people, these are dyslexic friends, really don't find reading pleasurable oftentimes. And so it's not something that is uh, uh, an, act, an activity that they do just for pleasure alone. And then in far too many cases, we're going to start to see some negative social and emotional impact. Because if you think about it, if you're in a classroom for six or seven hours a day, five days a week, for nine months out of the year, and you're constantly bombarded with messages that you are not okay, that there's something wrong with you, that you can't keep up, then of course, just naturally, that's going to cause people to have uh, all kinds of issues with their sense of self and their social and emotional behavior. So that's something that we really want to be thoughtful about and clear about, that that is part of the clinical picture if we do not, as adults and teachers, intervene um, early and appropriately. Now, the incidence rates are from the national statistics, but I think they mirror Tennessee fairly well. If you think about 13 or 14 percent of, a percent of students in the U.S. have a handicapping condition that qualifies them for special education, that's the entire group of kids that have all types of handicapping conditions. Half of those students, 6 or 7 percent, are classified as learning disabled. And of that 6 or 7 percent, 80% of the learning disabled group have difficulty with language-based processing problems, i.e. dyslexia. However, here's the, here's the kicker. Research, and this is research that's going back for decades, it's very robust research, indicates that up to 20% of the population suffer to some degree with dyslexia, and many of those students will not qualify for special education. But they will struggle with academics, and we know from the research they will also benefit from early identification and instruction that is intensive, systematic, and explicit. So I left you a link here that if you'd like to look into that further, uh, you're certainly able to do so. Now, I want to mention just for some, uh, for a minute, up to 20% of the population to some degree. And what that means is that we have to think about dyslexic people and students on a continuum. So there will be uh, children with mild dyslexia, moderate dyslexia, and severe dyslexia. And to the point is that we've got to remember that many of those kids are not going to get tagged for special education. So we need to be thoughtful about how, in a regular classroom, we support the foundational skills through of reading through early intervention and intensive instruction that we know from the research will ultimately improve comprehension. So if I were to take it back a few minutes and talk about how the basic building blocks would be the foundation for the child, we can't build a beautiful home on a weak foundation. So we need that strong foundation and that's why it's so critical to understand these kids and understand how to intervene appropriately. So let's just talk about some practical implications for remediation. Research shows that early intervention significantly improves the likelihood of success for struggling readers. For many years in our educational system, we've set it up, unfortunately, where kids end up failing for years before, or if ever, we finally intervene and provide them with the kind of academic support that they need. And what we found is that those kids who get their, their intervention later in their academic career struggle significantly more than those kids that we catch early and begin remediation as early as possible. Now, this 
This next statement comes from the National Center for Education Statistics, and you see the link there. Students who do, do not read proficiently by third grade are four times more likely to leave high school without a diploma than proficient readers. That's a big study, and that's been replicated. So it's a very, very significant concern uh, across the board in our educational system today. And we know that best practices for early intervention includes early screening, and we're talking about kindergarten and first grade, and combined with intensive, systematic, and explicit approaches to literacy instruction within the general education program so that all kids can benefit from this early intervention and early remediation so that we can improve literacy for all of our kids across the board. Okay, so that's a very, very rapid introduction. I wanted to keep it simple. I know you're extremely busy, and so I didn't want to uh, add too much to your plate, but I also wanted to offer the opportunity, if you would like, to follow up and ask any questions that you may have or have make any comments, please feel free to contact me at the email address here on the page, which is drmichaelhart at gmail.com. I would be more than happy to support uh, whatever you need from me, and um, uh, just all you need to do is reach out. So I, I just want to say thank you very much for this opportunity. I appreciate the uh, chance to speak with you today, and I wish you well. Thank you very much.